And welcome to Israel Under Fire. I'm Eric Stackelbeck coming to you from Dallas and the day of reckoning is here. We've been telling you over the past several weeks here on Israel Under Fire that Israel will eventually have to take action against Al-Shifa Hospital, not against the hospital itself or patients, doctors or nurses, but against the Hamas command and control center that has been cynically and diabolically stationed beneath the hospital as really a subterranean Hamas control center. Now, as I come to you, the Israel Defense Forces are doing battle with Hamas terrorists in and around the hospital, but only in certain areas of the hospital. Uh, the IDF has evacuated, or tried to evacuate at least, patients, civilians, doctors, nurses from Al-Shifa Hospital, which, remember, is in the heart of Gaza City, which is the main stronghold for Hamas. And this is not the only hospital that Hamas has used in the Gaza Strip. There are a number of such hospitals that Hamas, again, has stationed weapons, infrastructure, command and control, even leadership really beneath these hospitals and using ambulances as well to transport weapons and other nefarious materials to eventually be used against Israel. Why is Israel taking action inside Al-Shifa Hospital? Well, an IDF spokesman gave us a tour or gave everyone a tour this week of Al-Rantisi Hospital, which is a children's hospital in Gaza City, but which was being used for much more. Take a look. We are now, we are now in the area of the basement of the hospital. I want to show you a room where we found all the gear, the operational gear of Hamas. Hamas is using hospitals, like we showed the evidence in Shifa Hospital, in other hospitals. We are now seeing it in live in Rantisi Hospital. An operation still conducting right now. Look at what Hamas is holding inside the hospital. I want you to understand, this kind of gear is a gear for a major fight. These are explosives. These are vests, vests with explosives. Yeah, it's a body vest for terrorists to explode on forces. Among hospitals, among patients, we have hand grenades, Kalachnikovs, and then we have the RPGs. People shooting RPGs from hospitals. This is Hamas, firing RPGs for hospitals. The world has to understand who is Israel fighting against. You know, there are really no gray areas here. There's no middle ground. This is a battle between good and evil. As you just saw firsthand on the ground proof supplied by the Israel Defense Forces that Hamas was using a children's hospital as a command and control center, essentially using little children at this hospital, as well as doctors, nurses, civilians, as human shields. Many have called it a double war crime in that Hamas is intentionally targeting Israeli civilians, of course, but also targeting, as human shields, Palestinian civilians. Have we ever seen anything like this in the history of modern warfare, where civilians are a main part of an army's strategy. And make no mistake about it, Hamas is a terror army with tens of thousands of foot soldiers, but those numbers have been decreased seriously in the past several weeks, uh, thanks to the Israeli operation in Gaza, which is well on its way to crushing Hamas decisively once and for all. Now, the United States has confirmed, as the world questions Israel's accounts of Hamas using hospitals, the United States has confirmed that, yes, Hamas is doing exactly that. Here's an audio clip from White House spokesman John Kirby. That Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad use some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including Al-Shifa, and tunnels underneath them to conceal and to support their military operations and to hold hostages. You know, folks, it never hurts to have confirmation there from Israel's ally, the United States. It's pretty obvious, and it's been pretty obvious to everyone who's paying attention and doesn't have willful blindness for years that Hamas has used hospitals, not only hospitals. Look, the IDF over the past few days has uncovered rocket launchers next to kindergartens. The list goes on. This is who Hamas is. 
Joining us now for more on Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranian regime, and where this is all heading is senior fellow for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C., David Dawood. David, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, as you watch the operation in Al-Shifa Hospital unfold, the world is howling, or many quarters of the world right now, but how can Israel conduct this operation? And I guess it's impossible to avoid the world criticism, but I guess the question, David, is what are Israel's ultimate goals in Al-Shifa Hospital? And if they do capture this command and control center at the hospital, could that even potentially shorten the war? Uh First, let me start by thanking you for having me on. Look, Israel's objectives uh, at Shifa Hospital are purely military. Um, I, I know this having served in the Israel Defense Forces myself. Uh, there is no intention, uh, no orders to intentionally harm civilian targets. Uh, the problem arises, as you noted, with, because of this intertwining of Hamas's military infrastructure with civilian infrastructure. They've done this in different hospitals, in Rentisi Hospital. This is Hamas's bread and butter. Um, the reason for this uh, is, is simple. Um, if you can't restrain the IDF, right, for all of Hamas's talk of its ability to confront the IDF and to defeat the IDF, I think they're realistic uh, in their capability, their inability, or their lack of a capability to confront the IDF in a full frontal conventional confrontation. Um, so how do you restrain this military force that is conventionally far more powerful than you? Uh, one layer is to impact uh, the, Israeli, the Israeli public because Israel is a democracy, and therefore you have uh, civilian control over the military. Uh, failing that, you impact world opinion, particularly opinion in the United States, because if the Israeli public cannot restrain the IDF, the United States can certainly, uh, being one of Israel's main allies, being its primary military supplier, uh, essentially set objectives and limitations on Israel's military action. We've seen this in the past. Uh, the imposition of premature ceasefires and what have you in previous rounds of uh, fighting between uh, Israel and Hamas, between Israel and Hezbollah. Um, and I think that's what, what Hamas is betting on, right? It's very hard uh, you know, to argue against the image of a dead baby pulled from rubble. However, you know, whether Israel has done it intentionally or not, and we can certainly demonstrate that Israel has not done it intentionally, uh, it is still hard to argue against such a viscerally uh, emotional image. Um, and it's kind of a losing argument. No matter what you do, no matter what you demonstrate, the second you see that image, uh, it is hard to argue against it. So now we have with, with Shifa Hospital, right, the stories of uh, babies in the ICUs. Uh, Israel can release images as much as it wants of its attempts to supply incubators, of attempts to supply fuel. It can demonstrate beyond any shadow of a doubt that um, it is attempting to kind of work with the hospital staff to save as many lives as possible, but it is a losing argument because one is a kind of a fact-based rational argument and you're up against a, a viscerally emotional argument, as we just mentioned. Um, and that is something Hamas is betting on to basically induce the international community to impose a premature ceasefire. Uh, you mentioned uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's comments. This is exactly what they're hoping for. Uh, these images will impact world opinion uh, will create pressure to stop the war prematurely. This allows Hamas to survive, to rebuild, to fight another day, and as, they, as they've said very explicitly, to do an October 7th operation again and again uh, until uh, you know they come closer to their stated goal of destroying the state of Israel. Yeah, and let's hope that Israel does not agree, obviously, David, to that premature ceasefire. Mm -hmm. You mentioned those comments from Justin Trudeau. I mentioned them at the top. Guys, if we have that clip right now, can we go to that, those stunning comments by Trudeau yesterday? Let's take a look. As the world is watching, on TV, on social media, we're hearing the testimonies of doctors, family members, survivors, kids who've lost their parents, the world is witnessing this, the killing of women and children, of babies. This has to stop. David, this is just stunning. Uh, coming from a Western leader, the Prime Minister of Canada, essentially accusing Israel of war crimes and seeming to forget that I don't know, 1,200 Israelis were slaughtered on October 7th. Very short memories here in the West. I want to get your instant reaction, I guess, to Trudeau's comments, but also the president of Turkey, Recep Erdogan, added again today, calling Israel, quote, 
a terrorist state. This is a NATO member nation under the control of Recep Erdogan, who is vehemently anti-Israel. What's your reaction to these statements by world leaders viciously blasting Israel? The deaths of civilians, as tragic as they are, do not automatically uh, translate to a war crime. Uh, what is prohibited by international law is the intentional targeting, and I, I focus on that, intentionally targeting civilians and civilian targets. Um, however, again, that is not a hard and fast rule in the sense that if a civilian target, like Shifa Hospital, is being used for military purposes, it loses its immunity. Um, if civilians are uh, present in a target, in a civilian area that is being used for military purposes, uh, it, it, there's a proportionality test that enters into effect, right? Is the military advantage to be gained uh, by targeting this area commensurate with the collateral civilian harm that will arise from it? Now, an army like the State of Israel has to also, uh, a law-abiding army like the, like the IDF, has to give a reasonable warning uh, to, to civilians in the area. And reasonable warning, again, is not a hard and fast rule. We've seen even the BBC has recently put out a report uh, where the IDF uh, contacted a Gaza-based dentist to have him clear out building after building uh, of civilians prior to targeting. And at one point, the Israeli intelligence officer uh, asked this dent tells this dentist, uh, we will not bomb until you give us the clearing. Uh, and that, you know, I, I, there are many other law-abiding moral armies in the world. The, state, uh, the, the United States uh, is one of them, Canada's. Uh, I don't know of an example of another army that has engaged uh, with, for all intents and purposes, enemy civilians in such a way, basically telling them, you give us the green light to bomb. Uh, when it comes to Pre uh, President Erdogan, this is par for the course. Uh, anyone who expected that President Erdogan, uh, his you know, uh, seeming rapprochement with the state of Israel over the past couple of years, starting with the Bennett Lapid government and continuing under the uh, returned Netanyahu government, that this would be permanent, uh, has not been paying attention. Anyone who expects that Turkey uh, will behave as other NATO allies will behave does not understand Turkey and its interests in the region and how they don't necessarily always align uh, with those of the United States or the rest of NATO. Turkey is its own power. Uh, at times, uh, it has felt its interests are better served with aligning with Russia, uh, with helping Iran skirt sanctions. Uh, it is host to uh, Hamas terrorists on its territory. Um, this is not a NATO ally like the United Kingdom or France. Um, there was, you know, maybe the first day of uh, after the attack, Pre President Erdogan had issued a statement that seemed to condemn the Hamas action, and since then. Uh, he's reversed course and reverted to being the Erdogan we've known for almost 20 years. David, we shall see. Thanks so much for joining us for a great breakdown of everything going on in the region right now. We appreciate it, David. Take care. Thank you for having me. Folks, we covered a lot of ground there with David from Hamas to Hezbollah to, of course, that mounting international criticism of Israel by the likes of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and one of the usual culprits, Erdogan of Turkey. Remember, Turkey is a NATO member nation. In fact, it's got the second largest military in NATO behind only the United States. But under Erdogan's radical rule, we here on Under Fire refer to Turkey, sadly, as NINO, NATO in name only. Well, someone who has a great deal of experience dealing with Erdogan's Turkey and other international players is the former Israeli ambassador to the United States, our good friend, Danny Ayalone. He joined us recently on Under Fire to break down this diplomatic onslaught against the world's one and only Jewish state and what Israel is doing to fight back and how you can help. Take a look. And we are joined now by our good friend, Danny Ayalone, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former Israeli deputy foreign minister, Ambassador Ayalone, always great to see you. I wish it was under better circumstances, of course. But hey, you have such rich experience in the diplomatic realm, obviously. Right now, we see in some quarters an increasing call for Israel to agree to what I believe would be a premature ceasefire. Talk about why it's so important for Israel to finish the job here and resist those calls. Well, thank you, Eric. This is a very good question, and thank you for inviting me. It's always good to see you and be on your show. Um, I'll tell you, uh, just with, an, uh, with another question, just think of asking the United States 
to have a ceasefire with Japan after uh, Pearl Harbor or asking the Allied to cease fire against the Nazis just a month before uh, Hitler was uh, caught dead in his bunker. Um, anyone who calls for a ceasefire fire now is um, doing a great service to the enemies of peace, which are Iran, the Ayatollahs of Iran, of course, the Hezbollah, the Hamas, which is like ISIS. And, and we have to remember, at the back of everything, are uh, China and Russia. And the, the war is not just in Gaza. It's a, uh, I would say, a world war in different manifestations. But uh, you can have a, uh, a, uh, a dotted line between Gaza and what's happening in Lebanon and Yemen and Syria and the Ukraine. It's, uh, it's all over the place. And unfortunately, they, the, this, um, I would call this this evil force, of um, this uh, brutal Islam, this uh, Islamist and jihadist who are backed by Russia and China, they think that they have a moment here of opportunity where they can push the um, enlightened forces, they, when they can push geo-Christianity uh, into a corner. And we see it not only in the battlefields, but also we see it in, um, in the hearts of uh, American cities, of European cities, Islamists all over are on the rise, and it's all masterminded by Iran and its ayatollahs. What do you make of all this pressure on Israel to avoid supposed war crimes when Israel right now is fighting possibly the biggest war criminals in the world in the form of Hamas? Absolutely. It's certainly the biggest war uh, crime since the Nazis, uh, equal to the Nazis, uh, just like ISIS. And this is why I don't understand that allies like uh, European countries who are in the same boat with us, uh, instead of putting the pressure on Hamas, they put it on us. Because what are we saying? We are saying, we we're told, telling Hamas, surrender unconditionally. Leave the bunkers with your heads above your, with your hands above your head and you will not be harmed. And especially uh, free those poor uh, civilians in Gaza which are held as hostages, as human shields by Hamas. Only now, in the last two, three days, we see actually with the uh, breakdown of Hamas control and command that they do not have the same grip over the population. So we see now thousands, hundreds of thousands of people from Gaza moving south, which will leave Israel um, the, the opportunity to really go uh, straight on confronting Hamas, except, Eric, there is one problem. And these are the two or three hospitals where Hamas has taken the two major hospitals in Gaza and made them their command and control center with bunkers all over. Yeah, intentionally, as you said, Ambassador, using civilians as human shields. Things are really heating up in southern Lebanon uh, with Hezbollah. How concerned are you that this war could expand to another front? And what really needs to be done to uh, hit back against that Hezbollah threat to, to ensure that God forbid, an October 7th doesn't materialize on the northern front as well. Yes, well, Hezbollah is uh, another proxy of Iran. Actually, uh, Hezbollah, which uh, also is having uh, an entire country of Lebanon uh, under their grips, which is very, very un unfortunate. And Hezbollah is working against Lebanese uh, interests by attacking us. And this is the cruelty of the Ayatollahs in, in Tehran. They would fight until the last Palestinian in Gaza or until the last Lebanese in Lebanon or the last uh, Iraqi or Syrian in, in their countries or the last Yemenite. The Houthis in Yemen also were trying to, to attack. And the mastermind is in, uh, in Iran, and there will have to be some reckoning with, uh, with uh, Iran after the war. But uh, with Hezbollah so far, we have uh, made it very clear that if they will escalate the attacks, we will have no um, choice but to push them away from the border and actually to take them out, just like uh, we do with Hamas. Because no country, Eric, no democratic country will uh, live under conditions that we have been living. Right now, we're concentrating on Hamas. Hamas will have to be dismantled. Yeah. 
And uh, if Hezbollah will continue to act up, we'll have to do the same in, uh, in Lebanon. And the common denominator between Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Houthis, of course, is the head of the snake, the Iranian regime in Tehran. Ambassador, last question. We have about a minute left. We've seen a, a disturbing rise in global anti-Semitism. Now we see some pushback. Large pro-Israel demonstrations in Paris and in Washington, D.C. in recent days. What can our viewers here at TBN do right now to stand with Israel and the Jewish people really like never before because the time is crucial? Oh, thank you. Well, well, we have felt, we have felt the great prayers of our Christian friends around the world. This really strengthened us. We know we're not alone. We know that the uh, uh, Judean Christian world is united. We are fighting the same fight. We are living for the same values, uh, unlike those uh, Muslims who are trying to take us out. And this anti-Semitism around the world, the main cause are Islamists. I look at those in Washington or in uh, New York or in Paris or London. Mostly they are immigrants. Some of them are illegal Muslim immigrants who have been just incited by the Ayatollahs in Iran, by Hamas and others. And um, I think that what we all can do is call them out and most importantly, call on our um, uh, congressmen uh, and, and our uh, leaders to legislate and to enforce against this um, really um, rape, uh, rampaging of Islamists, uh, which are the cause of anti-Semitism, the new anti-Semitism now. Ambassador Danny Ilone, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. We will see you again soon. God bless. Hang in there. Thanks again, Ambassador. Thank you. God bless. Well, folks, we broke down. Uh, not only what's happening with Hezbollah to the north, with Hamas and Gaza, but on the diplomatic front, look, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey with these insane anti-Israel comments, that's the tip of the iceberg right now. I've called it a darkness, a collective darkness descending on the world right now with this, I use the word, I'll use it again, anti-Israel madness with hundreds of thousands of people in the streets glorifying Hamas and condemning the world's one and only Jewish state. Picture this and ask yourself this. If the radical jihadist terror forces that are bombarding Israel right now and slaughtering Jewish men, women, and children in the Jewish state achieved their stated goal and wiped Israel off the map, and by the way, we've read the book to the very end. We know that's not going to happen, but nonetheless, they say they want to wipe the Zionist entity off the map. If they were to achieve that goal, do you really think they're just going to pack up their bags and go home? Where are they coming next? One big guess. They call Israel, does the Iranian regime and its terror allies, the little Satan. Their words, not mine. But they refer to the United States as the great Satan. Folks, the United States is the ultimate prize for the Iranian regime and these terror forces. Look, there's a reason that at rallies in Tehran held by the Iranian regime and the Iranian military, Iranian soldiers stomp on not only Israeli flags, but American flags as well. Iran has been at war with the United States since 1979, when this Iranian revolution hoisted itself upon the world in evil fashion, with Iran announcing itself to the world, at least the Iranian regime, not the Iranian people, this regime announcing itself to the world by seizing American hostages and sparking a massive hostage crisis that lasted for well over a year. That's how Iran, again, the Iranian regime, announced itself to the world with a blow against the United States right off the bat. And guess what? Those blows have continued for the past 44 years. In 1983, the U.S. Marine barracks bombing. Some 243 brave U.S. servicemen slaughtered by a Hezbollah suicide bomber on the orders of, you guessed it, the Iranian regime. In Iraq, from 2003 to 2011, hundreds of U.S. soldiers killed many times by Iranian IEDs, improvised explosive devices, and take it up to today. 2023, where in recent weeks, Iran-backed terror groups in Iraq and Syria 
have carried out, at last count, some 56 attacks against U.S. soldiers in Iraq and Syria. Now, the ultimate goal for Iran and the radical forces in the region is the complete expulsion of the United States once and for all. Remember, there are some 900 U.S. soldiers in Syria right now, around 2,500 in Iraq, so there is still a U.S. presence in the heart of the world's most chaotic and volatile region. But it is literally, this show is called Israel Under Fire. Well, the U.S. is also under fire in the Middle East right now. Look, I say all this to say, folks, bringing it back home as we close out here, Israel's enemies are America's enemies. It's very clear that the same radical forces that want to wipe Israel off the map have similar intentions for the United States. You might say, well, the United States is the most powerful country in the world with the world's most powerful military arsenal, a nuclear power. Iran could never touch us. And yet, the Iranian regime right now is pushing for the bomb. It is pushing to acquire nuclear weapons, the world's deadliest weapons. And not only that, our own Pentagon says that Iran is also developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs for short, which do exactly what their name says. They are designed to travel across continents, across oceans, meaning those ICBMs are not for Saudi Arabia, Israel. They're not even for Europe. Those ICBMs, those intercontinental ballistic missiles, are targeted towards the great Satan, in Iran's words, the United States. By the way, we make a crucial distinction here. It is the Iranian regime that is the problem, not the Iranian people, who are the main victims of this wicked and diabolical regime. Iran, which is a Bible land. Remember Mordecai, Esther, Darius, Cyrus, Great events in your Bible took place in Iran, which was once called Persia. Today, it's Iran. So a closing thought, keep the people, not only of Israel, but of Iran in your prayers right now, especially the persecuted underground church, who again, are the main victims of this wicked regime. We pray for a new day in that Bible land, once known as Persia, now known as Iran. God is moving even in Iran. Thanks for joining us. See you again soon and God bless.